Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I'm going to be giving you all a quick introductory video to GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program for beginners. The quickest way to understand GIMP would be a free version of Photoshop. It's cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So it is a good tool if you are trying to edit photos or create graphics on your computer. So you may not see anything in the center area, which is your main canvas by default. So you would need to go up to File and then New if you want to create a new document. Or you can go to Open or Open Recent if you want to open an existing document. So I'll go to File, New. And the image width and height is going to be measured here in terms of pixels by default. So you can change this to whatever you want your canvas size to be. You can also go to Advanced Settings if you want the background to be filled with transparency. As in, essentially, there's nothing there while you're editing until you start to add stuff, or you can have it fill with a background color or foreground color. So if you look in the top left, your foreground color is whatever shows over here on the left. Currently, I have that set to red. And then the background color is the one that sits behind that red square. And this is the background color right here, currently set to black. By default, the foreground color would be white, but you can, of course, change those to whatever you want. So I'm going to go ahead and create this new image with the settings that already exist. So if you see a checkered background here, that's how you know it has transparency. So transparency is relevant if you do export to a format like PNG that supports transparent images, which means that any area that you see this checkered background is going to be invisible. Anything else on your computer behind it, like the background of a web page, would show in areas which are transparent on an image. If you export to other formats like JPEG, those don't support transparency. So these transparent, so these transparent areas may be filled with a solid color instead. So now I'll show you a couple ways that you can import images into your document. So if we go up to File, so if I go up to File and Open as Layers, and we navigate to the desktop, I can grab one of these images and double click on them, open it into this document. And if we look in the bottom right, you'll see that this chess image has been brought in as its own separate layer. So these programs like GIMP and Photoshop, they work in terms of layers. Any changes you make to one layer are separate from changes made to another layer. So if we look to the bottom right, we'll see that the chess image has been brought in as its own layer. So when you're working in GIMP or Photoshop or similar programs, you're going to have a bunch of layers which keep the changes made separate from each other. So any change made to one layer is not going to affect a change made to another layer. So if I go to this new layers button in the bottom right and add a new layer to our document, then you'll see now we have a third layer. And this one is on top of the first two layers, the chest layer and the background layer, which means it's going to show on top of those by default. So I can go to the paintbrush tool on the top right. You can uh, right click on this menu if you need to see the drop down to switch to paintbrush, or you could just hit P on your keyboard. And now I could just draw a stroke across the document. Now, if this was a real painting, you would have just completely ruined it. But this is its own separate layer. So I can hide the layer in the bottom right by clicking on the eyeball, or I can delete it entirely by clicking on the X in the bottom right hand corner. So as you can see, the chest layer in the background is completely left untouched so we haven't destroyed anything really. But if I was to draw this stroke on this image and then export it to a new format like JPEG or PNG and import it back in, there would be no easy way to remove this stroke. So that's one of the reasons why when you're saving a document that you plan to continue editing, you would save it to a GIMP XCF format file as a document you can continue to edit that keeps these layers intact. But once you export, to your formats, JPEG, PNG, uh, keep in mind that it compresses all of the layers down into one. You just have your final image and you can't really change it so conveniently like you can while you're editing it. But if you do make a change like this that you do want to go back on, you can go up to the edit menu at the top and then do undo, or you can hit command or control Z, depending on if you're on Windows or Mac, and just undo that change. So generally speaking, the more layers you work on, the easier it's going to be to continue to make changes to your document without ruining any of your past progress or destroying other layers. So if you want to save your document to one of those GIMP XCF files, you can go to File, Save As. Let's just choose a location on my computer. 
I'll just put it in this thumbnails folder I have, and I'll just call this gimptutorial.xcf. So remember that when it's in XCF format, that it will keep the layers intact. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the tools that you'll find in the toolbox. The scale tool, often very helpful. You can click over here. It has the arrow pointing to a box, basically the small box expands into the big box. You can also use shift S on your computer to select this tool. So when you have a layer selected like this chest layer, you can either click on the tool and then click on the image layer, or you can just hit shift S to go straight into scaling mode. And then you can pull any of the corners in and out to stretch and scale the image. So by default, you'll see as we stretch that it keeps the width and height ratio intact, which is often what you want because it'll make the image look correct when you scale it up or down but you can click over here to unlink the height and width, and then you'd be able to stretch one dimension to a different ratio compared to the original image. But as you can see, if we make it really wide, it's not gonna quite look right or tall as well. So that's usually why you would keep the ratio intact. To go back to how it was by default, I'm gonna click reset, bring the image back to how it was before we started the scaling. So when you're scaling your image up or down, one thing you might want to keep consistent is the position of the image when you're done scaling it. So you have this around center option to do so. So I'm going to hit Control Z to pull this back to its center space. And you can check around center or hold down the key that you see here on Mac. That's the command key on Windows. I believe it's Control. And now if we scale it up or down, it's going to be scaling from the center point. So that can keep the position of the scaled image exactly where it was to begin with. And that can be convenient so that you don't have to readjust everything later on. So I'll just scale it to right about here so that we can see the entire image inside of our canvas frame and hit scale. Uh, now would actually be a pretty decent time to point out that your layer size and canvas size are two different things. So while we have this chest layer selected, you can see the extents of our layer with this yellow black dotted line that goes around our image. But if I click on the background layer, you can see this layer has the same dimensions of our canvas overall, since it was created there with the canvas. And so those two things aren't always consistent. If I go up to image and then canvas size, we can see the size of our document and we could scale it up and down here. So if I wanted, I could uh, re-enable the ratio lock and just change this to 2400 and click resize. And you'll see our canvas expands once again, but our layer size did not. So it's important to remember that the canvas is what you're going to be exporting. So even if there's no information, just transparency over here on the right, it's gonna be exporting everything you see in this canvas frame not necessarily just what you see inside of a single layer. So now that we know that this chest layer is not necessarily what's being exported to our image, if we wanna make sure that only areas where our chest image is showing is going to be part of the final export, in other words, we wanna remove this left and right area, then we can go up to the image menu and then choose crop to content. So what this will do is it'll cut away any area that just has transparency, um, looking across our layers that there's no information there. If we want it to be specific to one layer, then we can select our layer. So just choose crop to content, and then that's gonna cut away those extra sides that don't actually have anything inside of there. So now let's start talking about some of the other tools. Up here in the top left, if we are in the keyboard or select from this menu, we can choose rectangular select, which is a way of selecting a rectangular shape from our canvas in which we can edit in various ways. So I'm going to left click, hold it down and drag a box around an area of our image. So this is now going to be our current selection. And now we can use the selection in order to make changes rather than applying a change to, let's say, an entire layer. So for instance, I can do Command or Control X and I can cut away that part of an image. I could go up to the Colors menu to make changes to only the selected area. So if I go to Saturation, I could reduce the saturation of that area, basically stripping out the color. So if I drop this to zero, then you'll see that this region becomes pure black and white. And this would also apply to any effects that you want to add in. So if you go up to the filters menu, there are many effects you could try and play around with. For instance, blur, Gaussian blur. So we could blur out this area. If I increase the size, then you'll see the blur increases in amount. So Rectangular select or ellipse select is a pretty handy tool when you need to grab one region of the screen. 
If you need to have more specific control, then you can use free select, which if you left click, you can just keep drawing around the screen and it'll just give you a free hand selection of any region you want. So a couple of really simple controls that are super useful. If you press and hold on your middle mouse wheel and you drag around, it'll actually pan around the image. So if you need to look at a different part of your image, this is really handy. All you just need to do is press and hold that middle mouse wheel button down. Another super helpful shortcut is zooming in and out. So if you hold command or control down, and then you use the middle mouse wheel, scrolling up is gonna zoom in and scrolling out is gonna zoom out. So by using those, you can look at the portion of your image that you need to be editing at any given time. So if you see me moving around like this, that's what I'm doing. Press and hold middle mouse wheel to pan and hold control or command down and then scroll in order to zoom in and out. The next tool I wanna to point out is the move tool. So if you click M on your keyboard or click over here in the toolbox, you can move part of your document around or an entire layer all at once. So right now it's in layer mode. So I'm gonna click and then move this layer to wherever I need it to be. But if you use, let's say rectangular selection and you wanna move part of your image, you can use selection mode instead. So just keep in mind uh, what option you are choosing here. Layer will move the entire layer and then selection will move whatever you currently have selected, which can be done using something like the free lasso tool and then grabbing that as a selection. So now let's quickly talk about the difference between the pencil tool and the paintbrush tool. So if we right click on this drop down menu, we can go to paintbrush, which will allow you to make strokes. Uh, by default, I think this is actually set to the 50 hardness brush, which will kind of clearly show a main difference between paintbrush and pencil. And now if I go ahead and draw a stroke, you'll see that there's a blurriness, a transition on the edge of this paintbrush tool. If I go to 100 hardness, then the edge is much, much smaller. It still kind of exists there as like a one pixel transition thing. But if I switch over to the pencil tool, and now let's draw here, then you'll see that there is no blurriness at all. The pencil tool is going to paint only in solid color pixels. There will not be any anti-aliasing kind of effect there at all. It's just gonna give you these very hard edges. So if you were doing something like pixel art, then uh, pencil would obviously make sense. In most other cases, you're gonna get a better looking result if you use the paintbrush tool, P on the keyboard. So paintbrush, even at 100 hardness, you can see how this looks a lot better. And then if you click Shift E on your keyboard or this icon up here, you can go to the eraser tool. So this will remove whatever you see on your layer and transform it into either the background layer or transparency. So for this image, it was imported as a JPEG, so it doesn't have any transparency on that layer. So if I left click and drag around, then we just get the black background color. So if you want the transparency instead, what you have to do is right click on your layer and then choose add alpha channel. So for a image to have transparency, it has to have alpha. Alpha is the opacity. What percentage from zero to 100 do you want the pixels to be visible? So without that channel, everything is just 100%, 100% opacity, 100% visible. Now, if I use the eraser tool, then those same pixels get transformed into transparency, as you can see here. Okay, so I'm gonna hit Control Z a few times to undo those changes, get rid of them, and we're back to our original image here. So next, a really common tool you're gonna wanna use, especially if you're making thumbnails and the like, is the text tool. So that'll be this little A up here. You can click T on the keyboard in order to access it. And when you have the text tool and the tool options, you'll see a font selector here. So any font you have installed on your computer is available here, and you can use that to type text. You can also manually type the name if you'd like. You can give it a size. Generally, I will use rather big text to catch people's attention. And you can choose the color for your text. So commonly, this will just be white. You can click on the foreground color here and change it to white in the top left. You can go down this color wheel and change the hue of the color as well if you need to and click OK. So that also updated the foreground color. So a good point is that these foreground and background colors, you can click on them at any time you wanna change them to any color that you want. And you can play around with this hue selection. You can go to the bottom if you need it to be very dark, to the top left if you want it to be uh, white, or move it to the top right if you want it to be vividly in uh, the currently selected hue. 
and there's these sliders as well. And in the bottom right, you can see uh, past created colors and you can just select from them really quickly if you need to switch to them. So let's go ahead and create our text. When you have the text tool, you'll see that little icon kind of looks like a dog bone. Let's click on the screen and you'll see this little pop up for you to start typing text. So I'm going to put in GIMP tutorial and these four boxes basically become the bounds of your text. So you may decide you want to change the color. So if you use command or control A, you can select all of the individual characters here. You'll see the yellow box around each selected character. And then you can change the size up here to 50. And the color could make it something like bright blue. Now when you're using these tools, it will only affect the characters that you have currently selected. And it doesn't update the tool options. So this is only for this instance of the text. It's not affecting your defaults over here in the tool options. So if you left click over here and you start typing a new text element, then that's gonna default back to that 300 in white color. So I'll hit Control Z to undo that. And I'll hit Control Z again to get back to our white text. So another thing you commonly wanna do is to center text or other objects onto your canvas so that it's aligned properly. So you can use guides in order to do that. Let's go up to the image menu, go down to guides and do new guides by percent. So horizontal is gonna put the guide 50% down this way. And you can use that as a vertical guide. Or if you wanna go left to right, then you want a vertical direction guide. So at 50%, that's gonna mean the middle of our screen going from left to right. Let's click okay. And now we have this blue line. So if we aim to go to the move tool, and then I'm gonna change it to layer selection over here, we can left click on our text layer and move it wherever we need it to be. Just left click, hold and drag it around. And it will snap to the guide as long as we have that guide there. So by doing that, we know that our text can be centered on the screen and that'll look better. If you want it to be centered vertically and horizontally, then just create a horizontal guide as well. So image guides, new percent, and then we add one at 50% horizontal and we could drag this down here and have it snap to both guides at the same time. Of course, you can have guides in other positions too, which is really helpful if you're laying out a document that needs everything to be aligned to very specific points. So let's start talking about some of the other manipulation tools that are pretty helpful if you're using text. So if we right click on where we have the scale tool, we can see the drop down menu here. Uh, some good ones are rotate tool, flip tool, perspective tool. So rotate, if we need to rotate something around the screen, we can select that, click on our object and then change the angle. We can either left click and hold and then just rotate this around. You can hold shift down if you need to snap it to 15 degree increments. So that would make it very easy to do 90 degrees rotation. And then you can click rotate to uh, convert it to the final result like that. Gonna hit control Z to undo that. You can use the flip tool if you want to reverse it. So take the G and put it on the right and the L and put it on the left. So just like that could be useful in some cases. And then the perspective tool, which is kind of cool because it can make something look like it's popping out. So I'm gonna left click on this text. Then you have these four corners to manipulate. So if I drag these corners over here and I click transform, then it'll look like the text is kind of growing out towards us, getting closer and closer as we get to the right side. And that can be the basis of some uh, pretty interesting looking text. Instead of just having it flat like this when I control Z to undo that perspective effect. So in the filters menu, you have many different effects uh, you can apply to your images or specific layers of your image. And I'm not gonna cover these in detail here because there are just so many of them, but one that is really handy in a lot of cases is drop shadow. So if we go to filters, light and shadow, and then choose drop shadow, you'll see kind of subtly the default drop shadow kind of makes a shadow of the text appear right behind it, but it doesn't need to be text. You can apply it to any layer, but I'm gonna change this to a preset I have that I use for thumbnails. So you'll see this is much more thick the reason for that is that the opacity is set all the way up to two here. And the X, Y position is jutting out more than the default, I believe, uh, for the position. So if I drag this out further, then you can see the shadow is basically just a copy of the original text, but it, it appears behind it. When I apply that drop shadow effect here, you can see though, uh, because of the size of this text area, that it gets cut out a little bit here. So I'm gonna hit Control Z a couple times to undo that. And I'm actually going to right click on this text layer 
and scale it to the image size. So if you do layer to image size here, you'll see the yellow dotted line stretches to expand the full document. Now, once we make a change like that to our text layer, or we add the drop shadow, you'll see that it no longer shows the text icon over here in the layers in the bottom right hand corner. So if I was to try to edit it, click on the text tool and then click here, then it'll say that you have to undo the other changes in order to edit the text. So just be aware of that, that once you make changes and effects to a text layer, that those may need to be undone in order to edit the original text. But now that this layer has been stretched, if I click on GIMP tutorial and we go up to light and shadow, drop shadow, and I change the preset to my original, you can see that this L no longer gets cut off there. So that's just a tip if you are having problems with the size of your layer, you can just scale it up to the size of the document and then that'll get you the correct results you need with your effects. So uh, one other thing that is pretty cool I've been using a lot lately is stroke selection. So if I add a new layer in the bottom right hand corner and I'll just call this border layer, hit enter to create it. You can take any color and you can stroke the edge of your document. So I'm going to take this red and I'm going to go up to the edit menu, stroke selection, and give it the size of the line you want it to stroke around your current selections. So when you haven't selected anything within the layer, the selection is just the layer itself, which in this case is the yellow dotted line. So if I use 80 pixels and I hit stroke, that's how you're going to get a border around your document. So you can also select a specific area. So if I use the rectangle select tool and I drag a box around this GIMP tutorial, then we go up to edit and stroke selection. Then we click stroke. Then now we're stroking this region. And the reason why with 80 pixels that this box is much bigger than this box is just because half of that stroke is hidden outside of the canvas. So it wasn't visible. And clearly 80 pixels is a rather huge stroke. So you can keep that as a lower setting. Uh, by default, it's actually six pixels. So you could just make that whatever you want. If you don't want it to be a solid line, you could make it a dashed line with one of these dashed presets instead. So that's going to be it for this basics tutorial on GIMP. I tried to show a lot of the tools I commonly use, and I think you probably will too, um, as you start creating and editing images inside of GIMP. So I hope this video was helpful for all of you. So thank you for watching to the end. I've been Chris. And I will see all of you in my future video content.